Good morning. I apologize. I am one minute late. I got held up in a class that I was not teaching and uh, just speaking to people. And so I'll make up for it. Like, you know, when you, when you travel and the plane takes off and the pilot says, uh, we'll, we'll make up this lost time. Uh, and I guess they, th- there's a mode on the plane that you can just make up for lost time. You're already going like, you know, 500 miles an hour. So I, I, I don't know what, what that speed is that they go to make up for lost time. Maybe we have pilots in the, in the audience and you can tell me that later. So everyone doing okay today? All right, good. Balcony folks, y'all doing all right today? Yeah, the balcony, you just kind of get the... You just get the fist pump. Great. All right. Let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we are so very thankful that you have allowed us to make it here to this first day of the week. Thank you for the ups and the downs of last week. Uh, may the downs have been used for your glory. Uh, might the ups that you've given us, might that just be turned into praise. Uh, Lord God, might you allow your Holy Spirit to guide us today as we study your word Uh, Might your word guide us, Uh, might it enlighten our pathway, might it show us where to go and what to do as we study your kingdom uh, within the scriptures. Lead us and guide us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so let me scroll through here because we ended up last week on a particular question, Uh, and it's the question that I want to begin with today. Uh, And the question is, that's not it, that's not it. The question is coming. There it is. Who or what has your heart? So, we are studying uh, the kingdom, the united and divided people of God. When we look at Scripture, we see this motif of the kingdom really from the very beginning, from the time of Eden until the time of Revelation, we see the kingdom of God at play. Sometimes it's very overt, sometimes it is covert, sometimes we have to kind of dig, but that motif is is there. God is always ruling. Uh, But last week we ended up on this question because the area that God wants to really rule over concerning your life is your heart, the very locus of all of your activity, all of your decisions, uh, every single attitude that you have is really reflected in your heart. If God has your heart, He has your body. God has your heart, He has your actions. If He has your heart, He has your perspective on things of this life. If If He has your heart, He has you. And so, uh, if he is going to rule, and because he's given us free will, the beautiful thing about God is that that we're made in his own image, and part of being made in his own image is us having the ability to choose, and he wants you to choose him. He wants you to choose his way. He wants you to choose to let him rule. So, we have to do some self-examination occasionally where we look at ourselves and say, okay, What is it that has my heart in this moment? I feel this way about this. What has my heart in the moment? I just reacted or overreacted. I just uh, kind of blew up on someone. Okay, so what is it that's owning my heart right now? I engaged in a sinful activity. So what was it that had, had my heart? But over the consistent period of this span of your life, I wanted you to examine what or who has my heart. Maybe it's, you know, simply your kids, and maybe it's simply your spouse. It's good that they, that they, uh, that you love them, and it's good that you, uh, you want to uh, please them, but who has your heart? Is it, is it, is it God, or is it a job? Is it God, or is it something else? Because whoever has your heart has you, but God wants to have your heart. So I wanted you to kind of examine uh, that last week. But uh, today, we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, We we spoke last week about the kingdom of God as seen through the the reign 
of King Saul last week. He is the human king. Uh, he is whom Israel, Israel had a, a suggestion, they had a request that Samuel appoint a king so they could be like all the nations, so that he might judge them like all the nations. They didn't want Samuel's sons, they wanted someone else, and so they got Saul. But Saul ruled in a way that proved that someone else had his heart. Initially, it looked like God had his heart, but as time went on, his natural default, and I think our natural default, is to let something else have our hearts, including our own will. We want to do things our own way. And this was the case with King Saul. And so that type of ruler, that type of rule, invites chaos. And it invites chaos because it's founded on disobedience. Disobedience breeds chaos, okay? So, uh, Saul was a disobedient steward over God's kingdom. And that disobedience, it brought forth division in Saul's relationship with Jehovah. So, when we talk about the united and divided people of God, uh, one of the aspects of being united and one of the aspects of being divided is this uh, unity or division in our relationship with God. Our iniquities, Isaiah said, it separates us from, from God. It divides that relationship. Our obedience to God, uh, it propels that relationship, a uh, 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 unified relationship. So Saul's disobedient brings forth division in his relationship with God, but it also ushers in chaos for all of ancient Israel. Eventually Saul dies, okay? His uh, son Jonathan dies. And what you see take place after that uh, are the result <clears throat> or is the result of the chaos that would ensue because of someone rebelling against the rule of God. Now, this is going to usher in the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom uh, led by King David. And that kingdom is going to be a kingdom that's really marked with unity because David is a man after God's own what? Heart, okay? So his heart is in it. And his heart is like unto God himself. Uh, God likes what he sees in Samuel's heart. His heart is such that he has surrendered and given himself over to the rule of God. And so here's what we're going to read uh, in 2 Samuel chapter number 2, verses uh, 1 through four. Now, what I want you to do here, this is, this is early on. This is Saul has died and the, the nation is in, is in chaos. I want you to see how da I want you to see David's attitude. I want you to see how he approaches a problem. And I submit to you that he approaches a problem from a very, what I will call, kingdom perspective understanding who it is that really rules. And when we understand who it is that really rules, I will also submit to you that we would handle it much in the same way. Okay? So, here's what we read. After this, David inquired of the Lord. Here's his question. Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah. And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, to which shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. So David went up there and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. 
David, he is a man after God's own heart, but he is not a perfect man. And we see a degree of personal imperfection even in the life of David um, by him having multiple, multiple wives. And we understand it was during a, a period of time when that might have been socially allowed, but we do understand enough through the biblical record that that was really never God's intent. So he's not a perfect man, but he is a man who understands who rules and who reigns. David has a situation in front of him, and to handle this situation that is in front of him, what David says is, uh, Lord, I need you to tell me what to do. So he inquires of the Lord. He goes before God. He's not going to make a move without consulting the real king of kings. David right now is not, has not been anointed as king when he says this. He's simply a servant, a servant of the kingdom. And as a servant of the kingdom, he says, I need to inquire of the king. So he goes to the Lord. Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And God says, yes, go up. David's like, I, okay, now that I got that, let's be more specific. Where shall I go? I want you to tell me exactly where I should go. When God is your God, when God is your king, when God truly rules, and when you understand the wisdom that is within God. Paul said it best, Romans eleven thirty three, one of my favorite verses. He, he speaks about, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of of God, how unsearchable are your judgments and your ways past finding out. David feels the same way. Now, God tells him to go up. David goes up with everyone in his household. They live in the towns of Hebron, and, he, and something interesting happens. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. There is division within God's people. And I would believe that such a division found its genesis in the disobedience, in the rebellion of God truly ruling as king through the hands and the actions and the attitude of Saul. God did not truly have, he did not truly rule over Saul's heart, brought division to Saul and his relationship. And this is a byproduct of the rebellious attitude of Saul. There's division in the people. United and divided people of God, here they are divided. They anoint David as the king over Judah. So, what about Israel? What about the nation of Israel? What about the, 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 the nation, the namesake nation that Saul ruled over? Here's what happened with them. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Manhan Naim. And he made him king over Gilead and the Ashurites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So the second king of Israel. David was the second official king of, of all of the nation of Israel. But here in this period of division, David is king over Judah, and Ishbosheth, Saul's son, is king over this divided period of 
the Israel or Israelite nation. It's a divided people of God. They are to be one kingdom, united over, uh, under God. But the reason they're not is because of disobedience. Whenever disobedience reigns, there will be division. Division in God's kingdom. But even though these men have been established as rulers over their respective realms, chaos still continues. Whenever there's a division, chaos will continue. And here's the chaos. Here's just kind of a summary of, of the chaos. So we got Abner, who we've learned is uh, the commander or was the commander of Saul's army. Ishbosheth one day accuses Abner of sleeping with one of Saul's concubines. Chaos because of division. Then we have uh, Abner saying, you know what, since you did that, I'm going to give all of Israel over to David. Because really that's what God wanted in the first place. He wants that kind of unity. But this is as a result of chaos because of disobedience and through their division. Abner then makes a covenant with King David. Listen, I'm going to give the kingdom back over to you. It's going to be the way God wanted it to be. Everything is going to be hunky-dory. Everything is going to be unified. This is the way God would have it to be. So he makes that covenant with David. But Joab one day, uh, who is the commander of David's army, he sees that David is going to be making this covenant, sends Abner away. Joab chases Abner down and kills Abner. Because Abner killed Joab's brother. What do you see in class? You're seeing chaos as a result of division, division as a result of Saul's disobedience. His disobedience is because God never had his heart. When God doesn't own our hearts, chaos will be invited. And then finally, Ishbosheth, who was the king of this divided Israel, He's murdered. The men who murder Ishbosheth come to David, bringing Ishbosheth's head on a platter and saying, "Hey, we did a good thing." Then David has those men killed. Chaos because of division, because of disobedience. But the kingdom of David, the Davidic kingdom, is going to usher in though unity. 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5, here's what, here's what we read. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. Israel says, we, we understand what you have done uh, you're a man after God's own heart. We understand what you have done as a result of the Holy Spirit being upon your life. We understand what you have done as a result of trying to follow God. You have led out Israel and you've led, brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel and you shall be prince over Israel. It, it was declared by the Lord that you would do this. And so, verse 3, I've highlighted, so all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and, da and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now, what God had intended was amazing unity, that his people be unified underneath David because David's heart was unified underneath God. I hope that makes sense. When, our, when the Lord has our hearts, we, are, we experience the blessing of God's rule. And the blessing of God's rule is unity with Him. And what we're going to see eventually as we get down the road, unity, an amazing supernatural unity with one another. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. But David continues to take the same heart with him. The same heart that depends upon the Lord. Because he understands, though he has been anointed king, 
that there's still a king of kings. And if there's going to be unity, if unity is going to continue to take place, if they're going to continue to experience the blessing of God ruling, then he's got to continue to let God have his heart. Chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. Then, or in David, lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. He built the city all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater. Why is that? For the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Why is the Lord, the God of hosts, with him? Because David's heart is with the Lord. The Lord rules over his heart. He reigns over his heart. And why does he become greater and greater? Well, those are the natural byproducts, the benefits of allowing the Lord to reign over you. He continued to bless David's life. And verse 11, And Hiram king of Tyre sent messengers to David in cedar trees, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. That's blessing. That's blessing upon blessing. Because David's heart is with God. David's letting God rule. But here's where we take a twist. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. What do we learn from a statement like that? Though David is king, he understands who the real king is. Church, what I would hope for us is that we would always know who the real king is. And when we know who the real king is, and when we operate as if we know who the real king is, that the world might know the very same thing. But remember, he still has his heart. Verse 17 through 25, here in 2 Samuel. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard it and went down to the stronghold. This is what kingdom people do. Now, the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. This is what kingdom people do. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? This is what kingdom people do. This is what people do who understand that God rules. Who understands that God is all power. They say, Lord, what shall I do? Is this what I should do? I'm inquiring of the Lord. And the Lord said to David, go up for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hands. God says, I will do it. I'm going to put them in your hands. You're going to have to fight, but I am going to win the battle. The battle doesn't belong to you. The battle belongs to the Lord because he rules over everything. So here's a question that I have for you. How often do you inquire of the Lord before you make a move? How often do you do that? Well, what move should that be? Well, let's take a major move in your your life. Are you inquiring of the Lord? A major move, a job move. Lord, should I do it? And I'm hoping that you'll show me if I should or not. And whether or not you do, I'm going to serve you as king on the job, though, because you have my heart. But I am going to inquire of you because you are the Lord. Should should I take the job? Let me inquire of you because you are the Lord. Are they going to cause me, call me to abandon my kingdom principles? And and I see them doing that. Lord, what what should I do through your word? Should I stand firm? Any major move, what should I do? I was reading a book uh, once, and it, it, it really encouraged asking of the Lord with even a minor move. And you might say that that sounds extreme. I will say the benefit of that is that I'm, at least I'm talking to the Lord. 
At least I'm speaking to him even in that, even in a very minor, minor move. I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm establishing my communication pattern with the Lord. And if it doesn't do anything else, it helps me understand. It, it convinces me psychologically that he actually does rule over everything. So I'm not saying that you're asking the Lord what you should eat for dinner, but I'm saying that there's a benefit that, in that you're talking to the Lord in the first place. But especially major things. David's dealing with a major thing. He's dealing with a life and death situation. He's dealing with the rule of government situation. And so he says, I need to ask of the Lord. How often are you doing that? And then if he is king, shouldn't you be doing it? If God really is ruling, shouldn't you, shouldn't you ask him? Shouldn't we inquire of his wisdom, of his knowledge, his understanding that stretch forth the heavens? His wisdom that formed the heavens and the earth. Have you seen the universe? God did that with his mind, with his word. Shouldn't I ask him and inquire of God if he is king? David does that. But let's read on. Beginning, beginning at verse number 20. And, and David came to Baal Perazim. And David defeated them there. Why? Because God said, I got you. Okay, you inquired. I told you I was going to give them to you. David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. He realized God was ruling even over that battle. Because he asked them. And God had his heart. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. Verse 22, and the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come against them opposite of the balsam trees. So he's not just taking it for granted that God is just going to uh, show up, he's still inquiring of the Lord. Like, you might hear this and say, oh, from now I'm going to do that. And Monday happens and you do it and you find good success, but then Tuesday happens and something similar situation presents itself and you don't do the same thing. Uh, David does because he knows God is king. And this time God says, no, don't go up. Go around to the rear. I'm going to be very specific with you. Go around to the rear. Come up against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. Let them go out before you. And David did as the Lord commanded him. Obedience. And struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. The kingdom of God is wrapped in obedience. There is no God ruling without obedience to him. Saul proved that he wasn't. Thus we had division. David proves that he is. So we have unity. Do you believe that God if he's ruling, do you believe he's already doing something? There's this, there's this book, um, uh, I'll throw it out there. I'm, I'm not saying I agree with all the theology in the book, but the book brought something to light in, in, in my mind. Uh, it is called, it's by Tyler Stanton, or Stanton. It's called Praying Like Monks behaving like fools. And in this book, uh, Tyler, I think it's Stanton, uh, Stanton speaks about the idea that oftentimes when we pray, we believe that God is not going to start moving until we pray, until we ask him for it. 
it's almost like God is just sitting around waiting for you to ask for a specific thing, and then he will begin doing that specific thing. But what the author points out is that then, then our view of God is very limited, that God is always doing something. And surely, there are times when, when he waits for us to ask to demonstrate our faith before he, he moves in a certain way, but God is already doing something. So here, what, what David is saying, he, he's saying that I'm going to already do something, and then I want you to act. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, well, that's, that's God. Then rouse yourself. Then I want you to act, for the Lord has gone out before. I've already started doing something. And then now I want you to join me in what I'm already doing. And if you really believe God rules and that He is King, then you have to believe that He has the ability to already be doing something. And what he wants you to do is join him in what he's already doing. So my encouragement, join what God is already doing. And ask him to reveal, okay, what is it that you're already doing that I need to see that I need to join you on? Ask him to give you the courage to allow you to join him on what he is already doing. What I want you to have is a kingdom mindset to believe that God is capable of doing all of that. Now, in chapter number 7 of 2 Samuel, in chapter number 7, at the very beginning of it, uh, we see David uh, do something that really, that stands out really for the remainder of of the chapter, and even the chapters to come. I didn't put this on the screen. I'm going to have you go here, uh, because I wasn't going to refer to it at first, but I think I am. I have time to do it. This is 2 Samuel in chapter number 7. And here's what we read. Now, when the king lived in his house, And the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Remember, God did that. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And the Lord was with David. But they were mistaken on a certain point. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan and said, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word? With, uh, with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, did I say to them, Why did, have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you shall be prince over my people of Israel. I gave you that, David. And I've been with you wherever you have went, And have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. What God is showing them, He's showing them the benefit of Him reigning over them, the benefit of kingdom, unified kingdom reign. And I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares, uh, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. David says, I want to build the Lord a house. Says it to Nathan, the prophet. Nathan the prophet says, that sounds like a good idea. God's been with you. He's going to continue to be with you. 
Then, then Jehovah speaks to Nathan because he's king and says, listen, hold your horses. Did I ever say I wanted that? I've been, I've been with you a long time. Did, did I ever say I wanted that? We've been through the desert. I brought you out of Egypt. When did I ever say, build me a house? The only thing I said was build this tent, and I gave you the specifics on how to build this tent. But David, okay, you want to build the house. Your heart, heart is good. Your intent might be good. But remember, I didn't say I wanted it. Here's what I want. I want to build you a house. I want a house to be established through you. It's not about this physical space. I, I'm, I'm going to build a house through you. Now, the, the house was eventually built through Solomon, and God, the Spirit, came down and, and, and filled His presence, filled that house for a while, but then His Spirit eventually left and didn't come back. Because God wanted something else. His focus is on building the house through David. So David wanted to do something the Lord never asked for uh, in, in, the, in those verses. But what we get from this is something so huge, okay? We're talking about unity. We're talking about kingdom. Something so huge is going to come from this conversation, Let's pick up in verse number 11. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. There's someone coming from your lineage and I will establish his kingdom. God's still thinking about kingdom, okay? He's never lost that. He's always been thinking about rain. But what he's speaking about here is deeper than human rain. I'm going to build you a house, establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, the house that I really want. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Watch this now. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, here's a verse that throws many off, and it makes many people think that God is speaking about Solomon. But I submit to you, God is not speaking about Solomon here um, because of some other things that, that, that I'll point out here in a minute. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now I've written uh, in, as the title of this slide, here he comes. Because what God is speaking about is beyond Solomon. He's speaking about another king, a king who is going to reign forever. Solomon never reigned forever, and it was never meant that his throne would last forever. This, this promise was made to David. Someone from your lineage is going to reign forever, but it's, it's not Solomon. Solomon reigned with wisdom. He had all wisdom, but he didn't always reign wisely, okay? He, he, committed, he committed iniquity, but the king that he's talking about, he didn't commit iniquity, but he did something for those who did. And so that, that little verse there, when he commits iniquity, or that, those four words, makes people think that he, he, he's speaking about Solomon. He cannot be speaking about Jesus. But I, I, I do believe that's, that's simply because of how this verse is, is written uh, in English and how it's often interpreted. But there is a theologian, a pretty sound theologian, uh, that, that translates this verse in a way that, that really says that he, he's not speaking about Solomon. Even if he didn't, 
The idea forever, the, the words forever, your kingdom, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That right there says he's talking about someone beyond Solomon. Who is he talking about? Well, let me give you this verse from Isaiah, or these couple of verses from Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Isaiah says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds or by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let me go right back to 2 Samuel 7, uh, 11 through 16. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. Let me go back here to Isaiah. He was crushed for our iniquities. So that, those iniquities were ours. He put them on his shoulders. He owned our iniquities to the point that I do believe that God could say that when he commits iniquity, it wasn't Jesus that committed iniquity, it was mankind that committed iniquity, and Jesus put those iniquities on his shoulders. He owned them as if he committed them himself, which he did not. He says, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of man. Let me back that up. With his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. God the Father has in his mind someone someone like Jesus when he says what he says to Nathan, the prophet, that Jesus was disciplined with the rod of man and with the stripes of the Son of Man, and by those stripes that he felt, we are healed. Adam Clark, he's the theologian I was talking about, he says, he he translates that, that, that little section like this, even in his suffering for iniquity, I shall chasten him with the rod of men with the rod due to man, due to men, and with the stripes due to the children of men. We get our first glimpse of the coming of the forever king, the king who still reigns today, the king who is still king of the universe today, the king who still wants your heart Let's pray. Lord, we recognize your grandeur and your majesty. Father, we're prayerful that we can inquire of you. Even the small things, the things that we believe are small in our lives, that we ask you to give us the wisdom to see what to do, that we converse with you that we talk to you along the way, that you show us the way to go. We pray that you would have our hearts always. And if there's anything else that has our heart, dear Father, loosen its grip upon us, that our hearts might be dedicated and devoted to you, that we might live for you as king and live within your kingdom. And be unified with you in the process. Protect us. Go before us this week. Guide us this week. For you alone are our God, our ruler. And we're thankful for King Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you.